Between 1939 and 1945, 125,000 young men faced the most dangerous task of any British serviceman in the war. They suffered the highest casualty rates. Nearly half of them, 55,000, were killed. It looks like hell, and you really think this is going to be it. They were the bomber crews who took on Hitler when air power was the only way of striking back at Nazi Germany. We were involved in total war. We were involved in fighting for our lives. I'm Ewan McGregor, and this is my brother Colin. We've always had a fascination with the Royal Air Force during the Second World War. Last year, we made a documentary about the Battle of Britain, but we wanted to know what happened next. The few had saved us from invasion, and the RAF was already building a huge force that would take the fight over into Germany. And that force was Bomber Command. And during my career in the RAF, I too was a bomber pilot. I flew the supersonic tornado, unlike my predecessors, who flew the legendary Lancaster. And I'm going to get the chance to see if I can fly the last remaining Lancaster in Britain. The pilot was one of a team of seven who lived, fought, and often died together. I'm going to explore what it was like to be part of this band of brothers in the air. Their story is one of endurance, teamwork, and understated heroism. No, I'd never flown before. I hadn't even driven a motor car before. You needed got a job on. And that's what you just did. You just sat there and did it. But it's also a story that is dogged by controversy. Despite the undoubted heroism, the men of Bomber Command found themselves to be ignored after the war. The massive attacks on Hamburg and Dresden killed thousands of civilians and were judged by many to be unnecessary. There was a war on, and we had to win, because God knows how it would turn out if we hadn't have won. In 1940, the RAF's fighters repelled German invasion in the Battle of Britain. But the German Luftwaffe continued to bomb Britain's cities in the Blitz. And with the British army defeated at Dunkirk, Prime Minister Winston Churchill identified the only way to hit back. Our supreme effort must be to gain overwhelming mastery of the air. The fighters are our salvation, but the bombers alone provide us the means of victory. Winston Churchill, 1940. And one aircraft more than any other symbolizes that struggle for victory. RAF Coningsby in Lincolnshire is home to the last flying Lancaster bomber in Britain. It's maintained by the RAF's Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. Squadron leader Ian Smith is its guardian. She's one of two airworthy Lancasters in the world. There's uh, only two left flying. Yep. Yeah. And uh, the other one's in Canada. And here she is in her in all her glory. Wow, absolutely incredible. Isn't she stunning? Yeah. So how many would they have built then? 7,377 Lancasters were built. Yeah. But circa 3,500 were shot down over Germany. Lancaster was the best aircraft ever during the war. It could hold a very big bomb load. It could take a lot of punishment. And uh, it was a real pleasure to fly. Four beautiful Rolls-Royce Merlin engines at the age of 22. Who, who wouldn't enjoy that? Oh, a fantastic aeroplane. Beautiful. She's a real lady. And like all ladies, if you treat them right, they go. The Lancaster carried the heaviest bomb load of any bomber in the war. It meant there was little space inside. Mind your head. And what will be transparent straight away is just how, despite the fact that it's an enormous aeroplane, yeah. just how little room there is in here. I just think you're just in normal gear here. Imagine you had yeah. a... I can't actually do it with my jeans because they're slightly too tight anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine you had an urban flying jacket on. It's all very well doing it in daylight, but if this aeroplane was on fire spinning out of control in the dark, it'd be a bit of a challenge, wouldn't it? Oh, just a bit. Look at this. Wow. Oh, it's incredibly uh, 
open the, the sights, amazing. This is exactly as she would have been uh, when she was uh, flying in wartime. All these instruments are original, yep, are they? Yeah, absolutely. So the pilot, the captain of the aeroplane would have sat in the left-hand seat mm -hmm. um, in front of you, Ewan, and this is a bulletproof plate here at the back there which would have protected him to, uh, to some degree. <laughs> You've got really good view and all the rest of it, but it does feel very vulnerable, doesn't it? You yes. do feel really vulnerable up here. I mean, this is literally only uh, three-eighths of an inch perspex, and the side of the walls of the aeroplane is, is, uh, is two millimetres of, uh, of aluminium, which won't stop anything. To realise my dream of piloting this precious and iconic aircraft, I need to train first on some other heavy planes from the era. The roar of a wartime Spitfire heralds the arrival of the man the RAF trusts to supervise that training. This fellow uh, taxiing in his Spitfire now is your uh, instructor. All right. And he's going to take you through the training for you to be able to see what the boys went through to fly the Lancaster. OK. Making this dramatic entrance is Air Marshal Cliff Spink, a former RAF pilot. He's an expert on Second World War planes and recently taught me to fly the Spitfire. Hello. Oh. <laughs> There's a pilot we recognise. They told me the McGregors were here, so I, <laughs> so I thought I'd better come and make sure you didn't get up to any issues. <laughs> Good to see you Good again. Good to see you, Colin. I'm going to see whether you remembered all you learned last yeah, exactly, year. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> I'm going to have to shift my gear a little bit higher up, though, I think. Last summer, Cliff guided me through the basic training all wartime RAF fighter pilots experienced before I was allowed to pilot the single-engine Spitfire. But this time, I'll have to master a two-engine World War II transport plane before I'm allowed to pilot the four-engine Lancaster. For me as a member of 617 Squadron, it's probably the greatest privilege that you could ever get is to fly in a Lancaster, so... You know, certainly a career-long ambition of mine to, to do. The Lancaster would become the most successful bomber of the war, but it only came into service two and a half years into the conflict. In the early days of World War II, bomber command was ineffective. Its force of just 280 light bombers flying in daylight sustained losses of up to 50%. In one disastrous attack on Aalborg in Denmark, all 11 planes were shot down. Then on November the 14th, 1940, a German night raid on Coventry showed the RAF how to bomb effectively. Stephen Bungay, an expert on the air war, has brought us to look at newsreel of the attack. All the available German night bombers were put into the air. On the night of November 14th, a million pounds of bombs were dropped on the city. It was the most devastating raid of the war so far. Coventry was smashed to Stratus Warsaw and Rotterdam. 60,000 buildings were destroyed and 568 civilians lost their lives. Coventry was a centre of aircraft manufacture, but instead of targeting just the factories, the Luftwaffe chose to flatten the whole city. Mass grave and things, something that uh, yeah. I'd never seen that, I didn't know that went on. What they, the Germans achieved in Coventry was a concentration of bombing. Yeah. It wasn't just scattering things over quite a wide area. And that, that's very important for the consequences that mm. the RAF drew from this. They realised that if you had some specialists using specialised equipment, which we didn't have at the time but quickly started to develop, then you could achieve concentration. And concentration had a big impact. Bomber Command now knew what it had to do. If it couldn't hit individual factories, it would destroy everything around them in concentrated raids. This became known as area bombing. The objective was industrial disruption. By destroying infrastructure, simply the means that people use to get to work in the morning, you can produce a dip in industrial production. 
The targets were the major German industrial cities, like Berlin and Hamburg, and the manufacturing heartland of the Ruhr. But it would take nearly two years before Bomber Command could put its plan into action. If I'm going to fly the Lancaster by the end of the week, I'll have to start my training. So I've come to White Waltham, a former RAF base, to learn on this wartime Dakota. My supervisor, Cliff, is hooking me up with Kath Burnham. Hi, Kath. She's one of only two qualified Dakota instructors in the country. Colin, Colin Hi, McGregor. Uh, he's your new student. Very yeah. good. I hope he doesn't let me down. He flew the Tiger Moth and the Harvard and the Spitfire last year. I hate him uh, already. Yeah. yeah. Go on. <laughs> Back on the heavy metal now. Great so stuff. Best of luck. Right, I'll see you tomorrow. Cliff. Yeah, cheers. Very good. Okay. Right. Shall we go? Yeah, let's do it. This is a pretty solid old aeroplane, the DC-3. It's excellent for him to get a feel for that before he gets on to something which is the extra tonnage of the, uh, of the Lancaster. That's it. Now I've got Kath next to me and I've got to make sure that when she asks me to do something, I do it correctly. Uh, it's just going to have to happen like that, so I'm quite nervous about it. He's asking all the right questions. It's always a good start. He, um, looking a little bit apprehensive, I think. You tell me it's turning. This World War II veteran is so unlike the type of plane I fly today in my job as a commercial pilot. Nine, the mags go to both. And even though it needs Kath to help me get it off the ground, I'm going to have my hands full piloting this beast. Cliff will be passing a critical eye over the proceedings. If I shout forward, just put your hand in front of your eyes. This Great is glass. Smash, yeah. Yeah. Now, after all the pre-flight checks, it's time for the real test. Take off. There's so much to concentrate on. It's so difficult to control this kind of plane on the ground. I'm straining to keep it on a straight track. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that was nice. That looked all right, didn't it? Nice and straight. Oh, sounds amazing. Doesn't it sound brilliant, that plane? Very good pilot, of course. One of the best. Uh, now you're heading for 110 knots. It's hard to describe what it feels like. It's like driving a vintage bus with manual gears after being used to a modern sports car. That was good to me, anyway. When you're in the back of a big aeroplane like this, you sense the yaw, and he was not paddling too much, which suggests he was keeping it reasonably straight. I've been flying for more than 20 years, and this is tough. It makes you think about those 18-year-old trainees flying a monster like this for the first time. At RAF flying schools, potential pilots were cherry-picked from the raw recruits. The remaining volunteers went on to specialise in other crew disciplines. All pilot recruits were then sent abroad to one of the 333 Empire Air Training Schools. They were scattered throughout the British Empire. 18-year-old Desmond Pelly went straight from Charterhouse School to learn to fly in Canada. Canada, of course, happened to be an extremely good place for training because there were no blackout conditions and uh, you, you, uh, you flew uh, in completely peacetime conditions, which was wonderful. Reg Barker was just 19. To be up in the sky on your own in a beautiful aeroplane um, with the freedom of the sky, a oh, fantastic, what a privilege it was. Now I'd never flown before, hadn't even driven a motor car before. Remind me when you take that one again. Uh, with the gear. With the gear, so yeah, yeah, that's already done. That's it, yeah. So we went final and you're stable.
on my training flight in the skies above Berkshire, I'm still wrestling with this demanding twin-engine workhorse. But now I've got the measure of the controls, I'm really enjoying it. This is real physical flying. He's on final approach. They've got the gear down. So, as you can see, he's working pretty hard. Get a trip if she's not. Sorry. What I'm nervous about now is getting this plane back onto the bumpy grass runway. The tricky part is stopping it swerving on landing. OK, this is the big moment. Let's see if he does it. Check forward. Bingo. Let's take a flap up to help. Busy with your feet. OK, pop a tail down. Now the fun really starts. He's keeping it straight. Well done. That was, that was very good. Good man. Let's take a flap up to help. Busy with your feet. Now the fun really starts. He's keeping it straight. Landing's one thing. But with a tailwheel aeroplane, the next thing is keeping it straight. Where is it? There. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you did that first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't kill anybody. Hey, okay, well done. Mando, a little red sign. Yeah, I got it. I think we'll quit while we're here, shall we? <laughs> All right, Colin. Good job. I'm a bit sweaty. <laughs> it was hard work. Considering you've never flown on at all ever, I think not too bad, eh? It was very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How does it feel? What does it feel like to fly? It's beautiful in the air. It's just really solid, you know. Yeah. I mean, like you say, you've got to you've got to come out and command it. You've got to you know, tell it where you want it to go. Before I finally get my hands on the Lancaster. Cliff has a much tougher task up his sleeve. If you went to the cinema in 1941, you'd have believed that the bombing campaign was going very well. Get a thousand pound of last, Mac. Bomber Command had switched to nighttime raids, and the crews were reporting that they were hitting their targets. Bomb's gone. I got a move out with the last one. Good man. Beg him not so cigar. But Prime Minister Winston Churchill was about to discover the shocking truth. At the National Archives in Kew, I'm meeting archivist Jessica Lutkin, who's going to show me what was really going on in 1941. Right, this is an important document for the history of Bomber Command, and it was written in 1941, um, and it's an analysis of the success rate of the bombing campaigns that went on over in Germany. It was the first scientific report that was done, so, so the first time they had statistics. Um, before that, it was just the, the crews reporting back okay. and saying whether they'd hit target or not. How did they gather that evidence? How did they get scientific evidence? Um, they used photographs. Okay. They used photographs on, on the undercarriages of, of the planes um, that would take pictures of, of when the bombs were set off. Right. And, and from those photographs, they could then write a report. I want to make a sort of snooker joke, but I can't think of one. <laughs> For those of you watching in black and white, the pink is next to the blue. Okay. Right, so let me turn to our report for you. So, there you are. An examination of night photographs taken during night bombing in June and July points to the following conclusions. Of the aircraft recorded as attacking their target, only one in three got within five miles. And over Germany as a whole, the proportion was only one in four. And over the Ruhr, it was only one in ten. Yes. Does that mean that only one in ten got over the target? Or yes. the bombs dropped, re hit the target? Only one in ten actually reached the target. So what would the reaction have been when this report was read by the top brass? And what was, what was the reaction to it? It was shock. There was, it was simple shock. They couldn't believe just how bad things were. Wow. surprising to see how ineffective the bombing campaign was early on and and, and clearly to Churchill and to the, the the powers that be at the time that it was so ineffective and um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they put that right how that what, what what they put in place and um, to try and improve matters for Churchill the answer was simple bomber command needed a complete overhaul and he started at the top 
In February 1942, Arthur Harris was appointed its new commander-in-chief. We're meeting author Patrick Bishop to find out more about Harris. It's one name who keeps cropping up during our journey through this research is Bomber Harris. Well, Bomber Harris was the name that the general public knew him by, but among his peers, he was Bert Harris, and uh, to his men, he was uh, Butch. He had a bristly little moustache that gave him this air of porcine belligerence, and you crossed him at your peril. But what he did have was enormous drive and enormous energy and enormous confidence, and he brought all those qualities to Bomber Command. He arrived at a good time. These big four-engine bombers were just arriving at the squadrons. And he turned these heavy bombers into a, a, a weapons of mass destruction. Mm. Um, I mean, fr you can date from his arrival uh, the time when things start getting um, very unpleasant for the Germans. Mm. Was he liked, do you think, by the, by the crews? Uh, I, I think he was respected in, enormously. And they, uh, I think, understood what it, what it was that he was doing. Mm and the fact that their lives were being put on the line, I think they, they understood that that's what had to be done. And, I mean, hard men are needed in wartime, and he yeah. was certainly that. Harris had an unflinching belief that bombing alone could win the war, and he didn't mince his words. The Nazis entered this war under the rather childish delusion that they were going to bomb everybody else, and nobody was going to bomb them. At Rotterdam, London, Warsaw, and half a hundred other places, they put that rather naive theory into operation. They have sowed the wind, and now they are going to reap the whirlwind. That whirlwind had four engines, and it was called the Lancaster. With a top speed of nearly 300 miles an hour, it was faster than any of its predecessors. And here's the bomb rack. It also carried the biggest bomb load of any aircraft in the war. It's 33 feet long. When it's released its load, another two or three acres of Germany will never be the same again. Harris now had the weapon he needed. He placed it at the center of his plans to build a huge force that he believed could break the Germans by area bombing alone. He dreamed of assembling a thousand bombers for a single raid. So he doggedly pursued the air ministry to build more planes. The drive to get the new heavy bombers out of the factory demanded a huge workforce. I'm meeting Susan Jones, who as a teenager worked as a riveter on the new state-of-the-art Lancaster. So, Sue, so this is the first time you've seen your plane for a little while, isn't it? It's so emotional. Hmm. You know, uh, I could just cry now just looking at her. Yeah. She's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. How long did you build these planes for? How five, long? five years. From what age? 16. 16. Regular nights. Seven at night till seven in the morning. For five years? Five years. Happiest days of my yeah. life. Oh, they were brilliant. These four-engine bombers were affectionately known as 10,000 rivets flying in close formation. You hold hold on to the uh, right, rivets. Go on. Yep. And then I'll go hold on to the back, and then when I call rivet, just give it a couple of seconds on the gun. Just a touch. Yeah. Rivet. Right. There we go. That's one done. Oh, that's it? Yeah. That's it. OK, let's have another go. Oh, you'll have to be quicker than that. Rivet. There we go. Let me see. That's a good rivet, though, no? Yeah, it's not bad. Can you get that underneath there? Yep. Ooh. Oh, sorry, I didn't oh, wait for your right, command. Yeah. Oh, oh, that, that will one, definitely that not pass inspection. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I think you should have a go. It's a bit heavy for me, this OK, one. I'll hold it with you. Right. Ready? There we go. Okay. Oh, that's a professional one, you see? <laughs> that's, that's a real pro, that one. <laughs> Think I'll get a job here? <laughs> in 1942, 700 of the revolutionary new Lancasters were delivered to frontline bases. The Lancaster was something else. Uh, it was a real war machine. It, uh, it looked the part. It's still, to me, a powerful, powerful machine. I'm very proud, you know, I was associated with it. Whatever manoeuvre you wanted it to do, it did. It did. 
it did. Um, brilliant. Um, you felt comfortable in it. Yeah. It could take a lot of punishment. It could fly on two engines on one side quite easily. In fact, I do know one chap who brought a Lancaster all the way back from Germany on one engine. To fly the new bombers, trainees were pouring out of the flying schools. And it wasn't just the pilots. Each Lancaster needed six more crew members. Two gunners, the flight engineer, the navigator, the bomb aimer, and the wireless operator. Bomber Command was also a multinational force. One in four of its recruits came from overseas. All were volunteers. In the wartime hangar, wireless operator John De Hoop recalls the reasons he joined up when he was just 18. One, you got more money. Two, you got sheets with your blankets, which I thought was so civilised. Yeah. Three, you were given a pair of shoes and a pair of boots rather than two pair of boots. I hated wearing boots. And fourthly, because once you've got your wing, uh, using a colloquial term of the time, it pulled in the birds. <laughs> the process of turning the individuals into a team was known as crewing up. This wasn't the usual hierarchical military process. It was rather more democratic. Looking back, it seemed a bit chaotic because you'd be put in a hangar and uh, they said, right, get on with it, get crewed up and close the doors. So we're stuck in a great big room full of pilots, navigators, bomb aimers, wireless operators and two gunners. And told yourself, get yourself crewed up. You stand around wondering what's going to happen next. Who should you go with? And this uh, chap came up, uh, he was obviously older than we, and um, he said, uh, he said, I'm a rear gunner. He said, I've, are you two chaps looking for a crew? He said, yeah, uh, yes, we are. And um, he said, well, I found a pilot. I've, I've questioned him, and uh, he told me he had a crash while he was training, so I think it would be bloody all right in the future, but he'll, he'll do for us. So I said, well, OK, that suits us, so off we went. So that was the crew. This was a remarkable mixing of classes, ages and nationalities, unthinkable before the war. A crew might consist of a former public school boy, a London docker, a farmer from New Zealand and a Canadian bank clerk. All of a sudden we became blood brothers. We helped each other out in everything and we were a good team. If we hadn't been, I wouldn't be here today. One thing that um, I remember with some emotion is the fact that uh, in the billet, sharing with another crew, all Kiwis, and I recall that both crews went on an operation, mm -hmm. and when we came back, all their kit had gone and uh, bed stripped. And I remember sitting on the air beds and being quite shattered by this experience of losing these guys who'd been with us. So we did what most blokes do in that case. There's only one thing to do, go down the pub and get sozzled. The crews were now setting out nightly in the new four-engine bombers to carry out Harris's grand plan of defeating Germany by area bombing alone. A mission could last up to 10 hours, targeting industrial centers deep in the heart of Germany. The telephone pads would ring. Then the flight commander would call it, that's it, boys, it's on. Then there'd be a deadly hush. That meant that night we are going to be on hops. We would uh, disappear up to the mess for your meal, always eggs and bacon and a sausage, a bit of fried bread. Then you would go up to the briefing room and there they would draw back the curtain and you could see where your target was, then it would be a big, oh, if it was, you know, a long one. Once the planes were loaded up with bombs and fuel, the crews were ready to go. Once you got on the end of the runway to take off, then the tension was really wound up. There was no talking at all, none.
you waited for a green oldest lamp and you took off and saw them waving to you to take off. I used to think, you know, am I going to be back here in a few hours' time? Navigator Douglas Hudson recalls an extraordinary moment just as his bomber force headed out across the North Sea. There was a flight of German bombers coming almost on the reciprocal opposite track. So the skipper said, don't do anything unless they do. And you know what they did? They just gave us a wing salute. And they went on to bomb Gould, and we went on to bomb Stuttgart. The crews would have to remain alert for many hours, and something stronger than coffee was on offer. Amphetamine pills. They gave us wakey-wakey tablets. <laughs> we used to call them wakey-wakey tablets. Personally, so I never, ever took them. Uh, I used to stick mine with a bit of chewing gum on the side, of the, the inside of the rear turret, you know. I only did it once. I didn't need them again. I was, I was wound up before I went anyway, like the seven from the crew. Stan Bradford was a mid-upper gunner. He's also a decorated ace. He shot down five German fighters. Never, ever, ever in my life was I ever comfortable. No. Frightened to death. And anybody that says he wasn't, well, he's a bloody liar. The crews were about to run the gauntlet of the German air defences. Back at White Waltham, I'm ready for the next stage of my training on another Dakota. It brings me one step closer to flying the Lancaster. And Cliff wants to use the flight to give me a flavour of how difficult the most basic navigation task was during World War II. Yeah. I've plotted the course, and I need Colin to fly at a set speed to get to the destination on time. So what sort of speed do I need to fly? 120. 120 what? 120 knots. Knots? Knots. Oh, this is miles per hour. <laughs> it is. Is it? Yeah. Well, we've worked it all out in nautical miles. <laughs> not looking at them. It's in really? miles an hour. What? What's the speed dials in this one? Miles an hour. That's what I thought. Can okay. You, can you manage that conversion? I don't know how to convert it. What is the conversion? You not to... Oh come on, basics. <laughs> <laughs> what's the basic one? How do you convert it from knots to miles then? Well, I'll just have to fly 138 miles per hour, and that'll equal 120 knots. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Good luck. Good. Good. Good on you. <laughs> no one told me about the nautical miles. <laughs> Thankfully, World War II navigators were better informed. It's properly exciting to be here. I'm a bit nervous about the navigation, but uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just have to see how that goes. But it is unbelievably exciting to be in this aeroplane. Yeah, maybe we'll end up somewhere fancy in Normandy or something. We can, we can have a crab. Modern planes have GPS, radar and air traffic control. But all trainee navigators had was a map, a compass, and a watch. First, Cliff wants me to navigate south to a point on the Isle of Wight. This is exactly the kind of training trip a new crew would have undertaken. What I need to do now is to use landmarks along the way to make sure I'm on course and on time. Should be crossing a road. Yeah. I've got a main road. Yeah. 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 But after a good start, I think I may have lost an entire town. You wouldn't know how to do a hazel mirror, is that, would you? <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm not a navigator. Hazel mirror? I understand these things. 
<laughs> How big is it? Well, there's a tire there, just left the nose. It's quite big. We have three minutes to target. Three minutes. Great. A little bit over to the right, Colin. Two degrees. Go back. You've got it. You've got it. That cunning little, uh, the target's on the roof, just a few degrees to the right there, Colin, that building on the, uh, the building, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Not to me, you, and you found it! Yeah. Yeah. Woohoo! They're going to smack over the top. Got that, mate. Okay, that's the number now. Target now. Yeah. We've reached the first destination. Not bad for a beginner. When we were flying to Lancaster, my Canadian navigator was able to produce a fix every six minutes throughout the flight, which I think was a tremendous achievement of concentration in order that we would arrive at our target dead on the time that we'd been instructed to arrive. Look at that dead on, 090. Very nice pilot, carry on. <laughs> now for the tricky part. Cliff wants to take me on a simulated bombing run over water. It's the closest I'll get to night flying, so no landmarks to help me at all. Target just on the left there, Captain. So it's actually the lighthouse, is it? There it is, my destination. The lighthouse at Beachy Head. Uh, we're going to be over it. We're going to be one... It'll be a bit early, I think. Maybe a little early, yeah. One minute now, so... We've got to the target a minute early. 60 seconds that mark the difference between success and failure. In a night bombing run, we would have dropped our bombs into the darkness. Over, uh, over the clock, no. On a raid to Berlin, we would have overshot by a disastrous 20 miles. But navigating at night wasn't the only problem the bomber crews faced. As they crossed the North Sea, they were picked up by German radar. The closer they got to their destination, the more intense the searchlights and the flak from the anti-aircraft guns. We were caught in searchlight, and they had us for 35 minutes. Now, you, you could guarantee, basically, that if you were caught in searchlights, you could say, good night, nurse. That was your lot. But fortunately for us, we came to it. The Germans had the ideal anti-aircraft weapon in the 88mm gun. Thousands were diverted from the Russian front to stop the RAF getting through. You can view the target on flames and surrounded by millions of shell bursts. It looks like hell. Uh, and you really think that this is going to be it. To overwhelm the enemy's defences, the bombers travelled through the target area in a tightly packed bomber stream. It meant there was always the danger of mid-air collision. Another Lancaster came out from our starboard uh, side and stuck his wingtip straight into us, just under the mid-upper turret. There was a good and incredibly a bloody big bang. Even though the tail of the aircraft was close to breaking away, Dave refused to abandon his position. The skipper said to me, well, David, you can uh, bail out if you wish. We could still be attacked by enemy aircraft. My turret was still operational. So why should I jump out? What, leave my mates? If the plane made it to the target, then the most dangerous part of all, the bombing run itself. The pilot had to fly straight and level, no matter what. You save bombs away, and you can also look into the bomb bay from the bomb aimer's position to make sure they've all gone. And if they have, close the bomb doors, and then they get out of the, the pilot gets out of the trouble. 
Then the aircraft lifted, having got rid of the weight, and we were all very relieved, shut the bomb doors, and away we went for home. Bomber Harris was a man in a hurry. By May 1942, just three months into the job, he mustered enough resources to unleash 1,000 bombers in a single raid. The target was Cologne. The first wave was so successful that by the time the second wave took off, they didn't need their navigators. Before we crossed the English coast, the skipper said to the navigator, I think I can see a red glow in the sky. It's a long, long way away. The navigator replied, that's Cologne. You don't need me anymore, just head for it. We could actually see Cologne burning from England. Looking out, it was just a small red glow on the horizon. When we got there, the whole place was a sea of fire and we dropped our bombs into the middle of it. It was a piece of cake, really. The raid destroyed two and a half thousand industrial buildings. It killed 469 civilians and bombed more than 40,000 out of their homes. It shook the Nazi high command so much that Cologne survivors were ordered to remain silent about the devastation on pain of death. For Harris, it was confirmation that his master plan would work. There are a lot of people who say that bombing can never win a war. Well, my answer to that is that it has never been tried yet, and we shall see. Soon the Ruhr, Essen, Berlin, and countless other cities were the targets of area bombing, being hit night after night. The bomber crews were now undertaking large-scale raids into the heart of Germany. They were often flying twice a week to targets up to six hours away. And with the US entry into the war in January 1942, Bomber Command now had a formidable ally. In the summer, the US began to bomb by day. It meant the Allies could hit German war industry around the clock. But there was a price to pay. The German defences were becoming ever more deadly. A Lancaster lasted for, on average, just seven missions over Germany. Only one in six of the crews was expected to survive a tour of 30 operations. The biggest threat was German night fighters. The tail gunners were the bomber's first line of defense. Learning how to hit a fast-moving fighter plane involved constant practice. Eighty-seven-year-old Dave Fellows wants to show Colin and I how he did it. So you did use clay pigeon shoot you know, you know, these clays as practice, didn't you? We did a lot, right from the very elementary gunnery school, because it was the best way of teaching deflection and also your line of sight. Gunners were given a regular allocation of clays so that they continued to practice. Ahead. Oh dear. I feel the fraternal competition kind of starting to swell. Pull. It's hard to hit these fast moving clays. Pull. Shooting down night fighters must have been infinitely more difficult. Okay. Really close. <laughs> From going through the training to actually flying in the rear turret there for a real mission must have been a big, big difference. I had eyes sticking out like organ stops, Did you? looking for an aeroplane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was an enemy one. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Oh, he's right in there, isn't he? He's right quick, isn't he? Yeah. Huh? Oh, you got a bit off the side of that one. Yeah. We winged it. You winged it. You definitely winged the last <laughs> one there. Having trained with a shotgun, 
Dave then had to master the 303 caliber machine gun. Armorer David Main wants to show us how effective they were. Ready? Okay. Okay. I'm shooting at metal plate the same thickness as the armor on a German night fighter. Okay, you in your own time. Go on. Okay, clear. This was uh, protection for the pilot and air crew. Yeah. Usually around his seat. And uh, it's actually failed to penetrate in the armour piercing or the ball. Oh, yeah, yeah. The ball didn't go through. Nope. And the armoured piercing sort of didn't go through either. It no. It broke the back, but it didn't More go than survivable, that kind of uh, thing. Dave's chance of shooting the aircraft down was purely hitting a fuel line, uh, a hydraulics line, yeah. or a control service. That is the only thing that was going to bring that aircraft down using 303. The tail gunner strikes me as the loneliest and toughest job of all. I want to get some sense of what it was like for Dave, aged just 19. So I'm going to squeeze into the Lancaster turret, wearing all the gear that he wore to withstand the sub-zero temperatures. That would sh shut behind me. That's quite weird. I mean, that is quite... That's quite a claustrophobic feeling. So that's your world now. For nine hours or more, this is my world. Well, if it had a thermometer in there, it would never got, it would never got above zero, that's for sure. It was cold. There was no good taking a flask, because it ran about 20,000 thousand feet or more. It used to freeze up anyhow. They gave you a bar of chocolate, but that froze so hard you couldn't even chew it. You couldn't stand, couldn't do it. All you could do was move like this. That's all you could do. It's difficult enough getting in, but getting out in a hurry was another thing altogether. So if I had to bail out of this, my parachute's out there, okay, I would have to turn the, the uh, turret into this position so the doors were there. I'd have to open the doors, like this. This one gets a bit stuck. I'd have to lean back, grab my parachute here, off that, and get it back in here, Clip my parachute on, then I'd have to turn the turret round so that my back was outside here, and then fall backwards out into the night. I, I, and if the plane was on fire or if the plane was in a in a spin, which it often was, it would be, I, I mean, almost impossible. I think, which is why so many of the poor rear gunners didn't make it. You know, they they didn't get out. I knew where my parachute was. If the skipper gave the orders to bail out, I knew exactly what to do. We had an attitude in our aircraft, in our crew, if the airplane stays up there, we stay with the airplane. Simple as that. From my mother's sleep I fell into the state, and I hunched in its belly till my wet fur froze. Six miles from earth, loosed from its dream of life, I woke to black flak and the nightmare fighters. And when I died, they washed me out of the turret with a hose. With limited firepower, the crews employed another tactic to avoid German night fighters, the corkscrew. This was a series of fast dives and climbs more suited to a fighter. But the brilliant Lancaster was more than up to it. If your gunner suddenly said corkscrew port, you went right the way, turned it right down like that, you screwed around at the bottom, you went up the gauge, screwed over the top and down, and you can imagine the strain on that aircraft. And with a full bomb load on you, we're doing this sort of thing. We were attacked four times on one night by fighters, and we escaped from them every single time by corkscrewing. But the corkscrew was only useful if you could see the enemy coming. In 1943, 
Crews reported seeing other planes blow up in midair for no apparent reason. The Luftwaffe had developed a new deadly secret weapon, known rather bizarrely as jazz music, Schreger music. German night fighter pilots realized that uh, the bombers had a blind spot, namely underneath. They were able to come up underneath and they had a couple of guns that were pointing up at an angle through the cockpit. The bomber they were attacking wouldn't see them, it wouldn't hear them. The first thing they'd know is there'd be cannon shells ripping through the aircraft from beneath. If the thing was below you firing this jazz music uh, cannon, there was no way out. One of the pilots who used this deadly weapon was Rolf Ebhardt. He flew the Messerschmitt 110, hunting down British bombers. He shot down eight. Tell us about the first time you engaged the yeah. Lancaster. Yeah, I saw it about 120 yards higher. Mm. So I was shaking and my heart was throbbing, of course. And I said to me, don't miss, don't miss. So I positioned myself under the Lancaster and not thinking that the Lancaster was on the uh, flight to the target, so it had all the bombs in. Yes. I aimed in the middle of the fuselage, and the thing exploded after a second. And uh, the result was I couldn't see anything anymore. You know, I was so blinded for about five minutes, and then uh, slowly the sight came back. Rolf was so close to his victims that he was able to record their serial numbers in his logbook. Um, that's it, right. really. Abschluss Lancaster. Oh, Abschluss Lancaster. I've got the code, code number from some of them. Oh. It was a third Halifax. And here, three in one night within 15 minutes. The new upward firing cannon meant that in 1943, the night fighters were accounting for 70% of bomber command losses. One man lived to tell his story of this invisible enemy. Reg Barker's Lancaster was torn apart by Schrager music. His plane went into an uncontrollable dive and Reg began to black out. I couldn't move my little finger even. I was pinned up against the canopy of the roof, the roof canopy of the cockpit. And I could see the fires burning below, the fires that we'd started in Kiel. And uh, it was quite evident that it would only be seconds, perhaps, before we hit the earth. Then suddenly, all was peace. All went quiet. Had I arrived in the place, at, in the heavenly abode to which, no doubt, the Almighty had intended? I don't know. Suddenly, there was a swishing sound, which I realised afterwards was the wind tearing through my clothes. I was out in the sky, I wasn't in the cockpit anymore. How that happened, really it's only a matter of conjecture. And I could see my aircraft coming down beside me, very much ablaze, of course. The parachute opened and I could see below me the trees of a wood uh, floodlit by the flaming aircraft. At that moment, I dropped into the treetops. So that was a miraculous escape. Reg spent the rest of the conflict as a prisoner of war. So these are my identity tags, dog tags as we call them. One was my um, RAF officer's tag. And the uh, other one is the one is issued to me by the Germans when I became a guest of the, uh, of the Nazis. Stelle Gluff 1, it says 5182, that's me. The nightly dice with death was a horrendous strain for the young men of Bomber Command. Gunner Stan Bradford recalls a crew member who cracked up on a mission. During one trip, um, we had a problem with our engineer. To this day, Stan won't reveal his name. There was no ginger. I'm not letting his name up. Ginger, no, he was ginger-haired. And Ginger, 
it wasn't available. It was hiding behind the pilot's seat. It was just took away. We never saw him again. Your documents would be stamped LMF, lack of moral fibre. And that put you in a terrible situation after if anybody was asked to seize documents, service documents. Cases of LMF were rare. For the rest, their stress was released in other ways. There were some extreme cases, people were shooting off um, revolvers out of the windows at night and, uh, you know, um, really doing, doing low-level beat-ups of the aerodrome and uh, all sorts of things, and they would just get um, told off. And they realised that you had to let off steam. Across the east of England, hundreds of bomber bases were bursting with thousands of young men, desperate to get away from the war for a few short hours. We always did everything together. So when we went out together, we had to get on by two-seater MG. So we sat three on the hood at the back, three on the front seat, and two on the front mudguards. And we used to strap them round their waist and over the bonnets they didn't fall off. And only on one occasion was I stopped by the police, not because we were breaking the law, but he wanted to make quite sure the two on the front mud guards weren't going to fall off. Ewan and I have come to the Bluebell in Lincolnshire, a favourite haunt of the Bomber Boys. Here the crews would drink the pub dry. <laughs> we're meeting Dave, pilot Tony Iverson, and navigator Douglas Hudson. Yeah, oh, yeah. a lot of silly things happened. Mm. But I guess you're, you're young guys, you're young, weren't you? It wasn't 19, ever 20, meant to be any, there was no old. malice of forethought at all. No. Mm. Like the burning of the pianos that took place and all the other things, motorbikes in the mess. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that. <laughs> oh, yes. Doing a donut in the mess. Doing a donut right in the mess. <laughs> well, that feels to me. Well, it's yours, Billy. brought a cow in the mess one day. You know, he got this cow in the mess and it didn't half be the mess. <laughs> <laughs> Many of the young men were inexperienced, baffled by the opposite sex. Most of us were too bloody young to understand female company at that age. We were four fingers and bloody thumbs. <laughs> and we were also told and shown films, vivid, vivid American films about VD. You know, the horrors of what could happen to you. Well, that, that used to put you off for life, <laughs> nearly. If she's easy, she's got it. <laughs> if, if she's got it, you'll get it. <laughs> and remember, a blob on the knob slows team up. <laughs> yeah, I haven't done that one before. That's very good. Yeah. By 1943, Bomber Command was fighting the war with an even greater ferocity. It was dropping more and more bombs but German industry didn't appear to be collapsing. After a while, people began to suspect that factories could be repaired and got working again fairly quickly. Um, so the next point of vulnerability was actually seen to be the workers. And this is the beginning of the sinister thought that actually the real target is civilian workers. Uh, the term used to describe this policy was de-housing. The aim was not just to blow up, it was to burn as well. Bomber Command was now dropping more incendiaries than high explosives. In July 1943, Harris used this lethal cocktail to devastating effect. Hamburg, second largest city of the Reich, is being liquidated in a series of record attacks by the RAF. The main attack started on Saturday, the 24th of July, and for nights afterwards, hundreds of our four-engine bombers kept it up hot and strong. We're traveling to Hamburg to find out more about the impact of the raid. A number of factors made this attack so shattering. RAF deception diverted the German night fighters away from the bomber force and the elite pathfinders marked the target perfectly. 
the combination of a hot, dry summer and the high proportion of incendiaries created a phenomenon never seen before, a firestorm. Temperatures reached 800 degrees, winds 150 miles an hour. Nadia Convery is a Hamburg resident and researcher. She's brought us to St. Nicholas Church. It was so prominent in the landscape that the RAF used it as a naming point. Today, it's a memorial to those lost in the bombing. That's unbelievable, isn't it, the destruction? Yeah. The blockbuster bombs, they were dropped first to sort of lift the roofs of the houses, and then they would drop the incendiary bombs into, into houses where um, there was a lot of wood inside. They would just go up in flames, and uh, the streets were quite narrow, so it was easy for the fire to spread. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. And that was, that was, um, that was the aim, to that set was fire the aim, to... And um, apparently the British uh, researched into to how flammable uh, German cities were. In one area, 96% of the houses were, were completely gone, mm. destroyed. I the Nazis feared six more raids like it would finish the war. 42,000 men, women and children were killed. Quite an eye-opener, really, when you see those pictures and you see the endless, endless empty shells of buildings and the tons and tons of rubble. I just keep thinking about families and children and trying to get, you know, as a parent, trying to get your kids out of that hell hole must have been beyond awful, you know. Nadia has invited us to a city centre hotel to meet some of the victims of the Hamburg firestorm. Hans Werner Prell was 13 at the time. Helga Hunter was 16. Very nice to meet you. Hello. The story of this, this yes. suitcase is a special one, actually. Um, so in this, in this suitcase were important documents, a bit of you know, jewellery. That's, that's all that remained. Mm. It's the only thing he saved. Yeah. He was clutching it yeah. through the firestorm. And then had a fürchterlich, fürchterlich. It was an arcane. They could hardly move because of the, the force of the winds. And so he's... he's he described it quite powerfully. He said there was this red wall coming towards him and then they'd get pushed over and he'd have to get up again and try and sort of battle mm. against that force. Mm. So, so that's yeah, quite a powerful image. Mm -hmm. um, he says that uh, just, just as you're sitting next to me, um, <clears throat> people would, would go up in flames next to him. Mm. It's unimaginable. It's just what mm. he saw is just... Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah, I was uh, at 16 at that time, yeah. and that night. Can I speak German? Of course, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Ich habe dann gemerkt, dass alles brannte, alles kaputt war und die Bomben alles zerstört hatten, aber... The streets had been hit, mm. and it was, yeah, everything had gone up in flames. Mm. And so, walking home, she had to pick her way across, uh, you know, people lying in the streets, dead, dead bodies. Mm. Mm because of the intense heat, the tarmac melted, and she saw people trying to walk across and getting stuck and then yeah, not being able to, to free themselves. No one else could help because they would get stuck then mm. too. I think when you read about the area bombing campaign and how that was described by senior officers and what have you. And there's ways that you can phrase it to sound like it's not the indiscriminate bombing of civilians. You know, you can justify it in words by um, you know, saying that it's a legitimate tactic to you know, damage the industrial might of the country you're fighting against. I don't know if you can ever justify one way or the other. You know, you can't say, you know, there's a statistic there's 42,000 civilians killed here in a week in Hamburg uh, in one raid. 
you can't ever kind of justify that. You can't ever justify the killing of innocent people. You can't justify the killing of six million Jews and homosexuals in concentration camps either, extermination camps. But it's not really about that, I suppose. It's just trying to understand, trying to understand it. Is. What it took to ultimately defeat that evil. Yeah, and that's it, yeah, yeah. And 70 years ago, things were very different. The war was far from won. Bomber Harris felt that more raids like Hamburg would bring victory by the spring. We propose to entirely emasculate every enemy center of war production if necessary. We are well on the way now to that end. The shadow of raids like Hamburg has influenced the way we fought wars ever since. The RAF now uses air power in a much more targeted way. Bosnia, Iraq where I served, Libya and Afghanistan are so different from the area bombing of World War II. We're all used to seeing images of precision strikes. Collateral damage is no longer acceptable. My old squadron, the Dambusters, was at the forefront of developing this new tactical approach to air power. It's currently on active service in Afghanistan. I want to see for myself how the modern RAF copes with the conflicting demands of using air power and avoiding civilian casualties. To get to the squadron base in Kandahar, I have to fly there by night. This is to avoid a Taliban attack on our plane. We've got full set of body armor on. Obviously, we're in a combat zone at the moment, so yeah, we've got to we've got to protect ourselves from uh, anything that could get fired up at us. It's four years since I've been with my old squadron, so I'm looking forward to getting there with a mixture of excitement and trepidation. We're making the journey in a blacked-out Hercules. Just before we arrived, a rocket was launched into the Kandahar base. This reminds me of what those young bomber crews experienced setting off on a night mission 70 years ago. In World War II, a thousand bombers would set out on a mission. Today, the RAF is using a detachment of just eight supersonic tornadoes to achieve its aims. And my experiences from Iraq are they're pretty similar to this operation, really. It's uh, a similar sort of size, but still nothing on the scale of um, World War II. I mean, uh, you're talking over 100,000 people flying you know, in World War II. The coalition is in the process of handing over power to the Afghan government. The highly political situation could hardly be more sensitive. And the last thing they can afford is to inflict any civilian casualties. But fortunately, modern planes are much more flexible than the Lancaster of 70 years ago. They can perform a variety of roles that range from attacking the enemy to identifying improvised explosive devices hidden in the ground. Wing Commander Keith Taylor is the current 617 Squadron Commander. He's at pains to show how he's using the latest technology to avoid collateral damage. Before he even considers using a weapon to support forces on the ground, he'll intimidate the enemy first with a low-level flypast. I did a show of force and uh, you know, we pulled up afterwards back into the wheel uh, and asked the ground commander if we'd met his intent. And uh, his words were, yes, you know, there was a bit of a situation developing down here and uh, I just wanted to show, you know, the bad guys that my dog was bigger than his dog. So. <laughs> if that fails, only then will he reach for his range of precision weapons, from heavy cannon to guided missiles and bombs. And to help the crews make the right decision, they are also using some of the world's most powerful cameras in what's known as the lightning pod. 
So you, you can, I mean, you basically can, even up at sort of 15, 20,000 feet, yeah. you can pick out an individual person. Absolutely, sure. you can pick yeah. out people. Uh, you know, we could really get up close and, uh, you know, in some situations identify whether or not the guys are you know, carrying weapons or not. On the current tour, the squadron has flown hundreds of missions deterring insurgents without dropping a single bomb. All this makes you realise what a blunt but effective instrument Bomber Command was for the first years of the war. But in 1944, Churchill wanted to use the bombers differently. He felt they were now capable of a much more precise role. In the build-up to D-Day, he wanted Harris to move from bombing German cities to hitting specific communication and transport targets. Bomber Command had made huge advances in the last two years of total war. It had become the most destructive force in history. But it was now more than capable of carrying out this new task of precision bombing. The switch to new methods, it was now safer to fly in daylight, so some of the raids took place in daylight, was not welcome to Harris. He still stuck to his doctrine that the way to win the war was to flatten as many German cities uh, as possible. So he put up uh, quite a strong rearguard action as only he could against a move that everyone else seemed to think was the right one. Bomber Command had been a very blunt instrument indeed. At this stage in the war, it's now becoming a surgical instrument, something that is capable of carrying out uh, applied violence in a very precise way. My old squadron, the Dambusters, was pivotal in developing these new tactics. They were formed in 1943 to attack the dams of the Ruhr Valley using inventor Barnes Wallace's revolutionary bouncing bomb. In 1944, they undertook perhaps the most audacious precision raid of the war. We've come to the squadron's former officer's mess, now the Petwood Hotel, to meet squadron leader Tony Iveson to talk about his part in the raid. The Tirpitz was the largest remaining German battleship. She represented the most powerful single threat to Allied shipping and it became a British obsession to sink her. She was sheltering in the safe haven of the Norwegian fjords, almost out of range. They adapted the Lackster with more powerful engines and took out the mid-upper turret and the, and the front guns and lots of other heavy stuff, including the, um, the armor plating behind my seat. The Lancaster could then reach Tromso from northern Scotland, which was about well, it, was, it turned out to be a 12 and a half hour flight. The bomb chosen to sink the Tirpitz was the latest Barnes Wallace wonder weapon, the 12,000 pound toll boy. We lined up for the, for the run in, and the first nine bombs of 617 squadron went down in 90 seconds. So, had you been standing on Tirpitz, you had nine five ton, ton bombs arriving through the speed of sound on the way down. And there were two direct hits and three near misses. And that 56,000 th 56, yeah. ton battleship was doomed from that moment. Mm, yeah. The ship's still firing as the bomb bursts flash and gleam. In the smoke of giant explosions, the turbots capsizes and sinks. It was an astonishing demonstration of how far Bomber Command had come. And it had been achieved with the mighty Lancaster. Today is my chance to fly it. I think, I think for me as a member of 617 Squadron, it's probably the greatest privilege that you could get, ever get is to fly in a Lancaster, so. And obviously it's the only one that's left in the UK. But the fact that we're going to be able to do it with you on board as well is really um, incredible that both of us are going to be able to experience this at the same time. And, uh, and that's what it was all about. It was about being a crew and it was about that, that um, band of brothers kind of feeling. So 
you know, to do it with the person that you feel the closest to is really quite, um, quite something. It's as iconic the Lancaster as the Spitfire was. The Spitfires were f fighting one against one in the air with against the enemy, and in the Lancaster, you know, there, it was it's much more complicated than that. They were they were bombing towns and cities, and that's over the over the week that we've been doing this. The time that we've been doing this has been, you know, I've been getting more and more of a sense of how complicated that is. The last flying Lancaster is so precious that the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight will only take her up in ideal conditions. So it's great that the weather is perfect. I can't believe you erased a paper. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. You got to remember that this is um, the war machine, really, and um, people went to war in it, and some a lot of them didn't come back. So, um, well, the pipes make you feel quite emotional yeah. as well, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, nice to touch that. A large crowd, including some of the veterans, is here to see the Lancaster on one of the few occasions in the year she takes to the air. This is this is your end of the aircraft, wasn't it? That's so. right. Then when we got the word to go up the ladder, and then I used to turn to the left. Yeah. Back and slide myself into there. <laughs> check the rotation of the turret once the yeah. engines have started. Yeah. Just check everything through. Anyone who says he is not afraid is yeah. not a human being. Yes. And the, the worst period I felt was before a flight. Yeah. When we knew where we were going and you had the hours getting ready and you couldn't stop this churning around or in mind. But yeah. once you were in the aeroplane, you had a job to do. Well, it was a different, different yeah. situation. And yeah. She was a beautiful aeroplane, and to, for, as you as a pilot will understand how, how thrilling it is to handle such a big machine mm -hmm. on takeoff and feel her ready just to... Yes, uh, flying was still, in, mm. even those days, exciting. Yeah. Did you shake hands before you got on with each other, or no? Was there no. another that sort of sense, you know? No, the, the, no. The, crew would, <laughs> the crew would piss on that wheel. But... <laughs> we would do that, but there's just too many people standing around watching. Otherwise, uh, we, would, we would do that yeah. very thing. Yeah. Thank you very yeah, much, I'll though. You... Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Cheers. Enjoy that trip. Yeah, thank you, thank you very yeah, much. Thank you very much. Thank you. You yeah. enjoy that trip. Yeah, sure you do. Will. Thank you. Turn agree now. Ah, it's an amazing feeling, exhilarating as the tail lifts. Seventy knots. Eighty knots. Brakes uh, are brakes off gear, please. Things are a little shoddy. Who's driving left? I'm right. And then it's the moment I've been waiting for. I'm handed the controls. I'm piloting the RAF's only flying Lancaster. So we're just coming up this right hand side, is that what you want? Yeah, I think. Okay, you're into position. You're in your right. In the nose, thank you, yep. Yeah. And I'm in the nose of the Lancaster with my brother at the controls. What a moment. 
unbelievable view, though, isn't it? Here. We're flying in the Lincolnshire skies that 70 years ago would have been full of hundreds of bombers about to head off to Germany, containing thousands of nervous young men, some who would never come back. Then all too soon, I have to hand back the controls. You have control? the crowd below, and then it's time to land. The last flying Lancaster in Britain, one of the 7,000 or so that flew 156,000 sorties, is safely back on the ground. Don't fall out. That was unbelievable. That was really properly amazing. Properly amazing. So kind of angles I've never seen before in my life taking off from there. <laughs> It was just extraordinary because you see the whole, the wings, watch all the four engines starting up in front of you. I went through to the front, there's a view I've never seen before, like lying on my belly looking down out at the ground and the sky and an experience that you can't imagine. Well done. Well done. That was really good flying. Colin, really good, good flying. Good. The Lancaster was a brilliant plane, but it was still a devastating weapon of war and nearly 800 of them took part in the raid in 1945 that defined how some have judged Bomber Command ever since. The D-Day invasion had led to a combined push by land and air forces from the west. The Russians too were pressing from the east. Stalin called on the Western Allies to help clear the way for the Red Army. Sir Winston Churchill agreed to the last great bomber offensive of the war, the one that everyone remembers. The irony is that when Bomber Command was finally able to do what it had always been trying to do, trying to do it had lost a lot of its sense. But Harris being Harris, he carried on. And one can say that with Dresden, it turned out to be a city too far. In February 1945, the Allies unleashed Operation Thunderclap on the city of Dresden. Dresden, the capital of Saxony, becomes a fantasy of the destructive pyrotechnics of the air war. The city was a railway hub through which German troops traveled to the Eastern Front, but it was also packed with a million refugees escaping the Russian onslaught. The bombing was so devastating that it whipped up another firestorm. It killed 25,000 people. Churchill had approved the plan, but within weeks he had changed his tune, perhaps with an eye to the imminent peace. The destruction of Dresden remains a serious query against the conduct of the Allied bombing. Winston Churchill, 1945. Harris was appalled by Churchill's comments. To his dying day, he defended the policy of area bombing. Harris had been an outstanding leader. He motivated his men. He did what he was told very effectively. But by the end of the war, it has to be said, uh, he was wrong uh, to persist in this notion that they should carry on battering German cities when the war was obviously won. It was doing no good. In fact, it was doing harm. 
At the end of the war in Europe on May 13, 1945, Winston Churchill went on the radio to thank our armed forces. He chose not to mention Bomber Command at all. I thought we got uh, a rough deal. Not so much us, although they didn't give us a medal, but there, that's only a, another only trinket, really. But I thought the treatment that Bomber Harris got was absolutely, utterly disgraceful because he was only carrying out the orders of Churchill. Harris's vision of a war won by heavy bombers alone never came to pass. German war industry was damaged, yet never collapsed. But a million troops and thousands of anti-aircraft guns were pinned down defending the Reich. For those who fought in the campaign, there were few doubts about its value. No, total war was, is total war, and we were involved in total war. We were involved in fighting for our lives, and Bomber Command was the only force that could take the war to Germany for four long years. They started it. They were, what did they do, Oak Switch and all these places? I mean, Christ almighty, I mean, um, they're the ones that started the bloody war. We didn't. Uh, and, well, we finished it off, showed them with, with, with their tails between their legs. I felt, I felt badly about it in many respects. And yet, you know, I mean, the war doesn't have Marquess of Queensby rules. And of course, immediately after the war, we got all the screed of what had happened in the concentration camps and the extermination camps. And I suppose, um, you know, it rather hardens one's heart. Today, the controversy around the bombing campaign of World War II still remains. Only in the summer of 2012, nearly 70 years after the war, will there be a memorial in London to honour the 125,000 men of Bomber Command. It's very sad that the 55,500 young men of Bomber Command who were killed have never been recognised until now, which is too late, in my view. It's a pity. But it's, uh, it is a little late, uh, but thank goodness uh, a memorial is now going to be put up for them. I knew when we started this project that it was going to be a, a really difficult journey in places, and it has been difficult. You know, our visit to Hamburg has raised some, some questions in my mind. But what this journey has taught me is that these very young men who joined Bomber Command joined the only force that was taking the fight to Germany. What has struck me is how young they were and what a terrible price they paid. Almost beyond any of the controversy, I'm also unmoved in my feelings about the men who flew in those planes because they were demonstrating such unbelievable bravery to get in those bomber planes night after night after night after night. 12-hour missions, freezing cold, cramped, frightened. And the fact that they would lose friends and they would still get back in the planes. So I haven't changed my mind about them. Other, they're, they're, they're the heroes I always thought that they were. The start of a major new series tomorrow night here on BBC One. Andrew Marr chronicles the life and reign of Queen Elizabeth II with the help of archive footage and interviews with the royal family. The Diamond Queen at nine o'clock.